Grace and peace to you from God our Father and from the Lord Jesus, dear friends. It's hard not to be taken back just a little bit by the very powerful and dramatic words that we heard in the gospel reading today. Jesus says to his people, whoever wants to be my disciple must deny themselves, take up their cross, and follow me. For whoever wants to save their life will lose it. But whoever loses their life for me will find it. So deny yourself. Take up the cross. Lose your life for me. Clearly, Jesus is calling for a total commitment on the part of his people, right? I mentioned earlier that this weekend at Bethany is confirmation. Ten young people in our congregation will be promising this same sort of commitment. They're going to be asked questions like these. Do you intend to continue steadfast in the teaching of God's word and endure all things, even death, rather than fall away from it? Total commitment. Do you intend faithfully to conform all your life to the teachings of God's word and in faith and action remain true to God as long as you live? Total commitment. And I anticipate that all 10 of those young people are going to answer yes to both of those questions and others just like them. Most of you here today gave that same answer to those same questions at one time or another when you were confirmed, as did I. But did we really stop and consider, and do we really stop and consider just exactly what kind of commitment God is asking of his people? Do we understand what that's going to look like in our lives? Do we ask ourselves, why would a person want to make a commitment like this? And how is it even possible? In our verses from Romans 12 today, the Apostle Paul takes up all of those questions. He speaks about this total commitment that God asks of his people. He takes Jesus' words about self-denial and cross-bearing and giving up our life for him, and he rolls them all together into this one very powerful and dramatic encouragement that is intended for every single person who's been called to be a disciple of Jesus. Paul says, offer your bodies as a living sacrifice. There's the commitment that God requires. So please listen to these words from Romans chapter 12. Paul says, Therefore I urge you, brothers and sisters, in view of God's mercy, to offer your bodies as a living sacrifice, holy and pleasing to God. This is your true and proper worship. Do not conform to the pattern of this world, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind. Then you will be able to test and to prove what God's will is, his good, pleasing, and perfect will. For by the grace given me, I say to every one of you, do not think of yourself more highly than you ought, but rather think of yourself with sober judgment in accordance with the faith God has distributed to each of you. For just as each of us has one body with many members, and these members do not all have the same function, so in Christ we, though many, form one body, and each member belongs to all the others. We have different gifts according to the grace given to each of us. If your gift is prophesying, then prophesy in accordance with your faith. If it is serving, then serve. If it is teaching, then teach. 
If it is to encourage, then give encouragement. If it is giving, then give generously. If it is to lead, do it diligently. If it is to show mercy, do it cheerfully. So what exactly is a living sacrifice? I mean, the two words don't really seem to go together, do they? For centuries, God commanded his Old Testament people to bring sacrifices as part of their true and proper worship. But those sacrifices were slaughtered. They were burnt up. They were offered in their entirety. And so once made, that was it, at least for that particular sacrifice. But Paul says to us, offer your bodies as a living sacrifice. So this isn't a one and done kind of thing. Paul's saying, offer yourself daily as a living, breathing sacrifice to God in all that you do. This is total commitment. It's so much more than just following a bunch of rules or checking off a list of things that we ought to do or something like that. And what Paul is saying here is that we offer ourselves in our entirety, every moment of every day for as long as we live in this world. Total commitment. So what does that look like exactly? Well, Paul begins this way. He says, do not conform to the pattern of this world, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind. Now, if you've been looking at the screens today, maybe you've been wondering a little bit, why the butterflies? It's more than just the fact that they're pretty to look at. I, I hope you're enjoying them. But no, the reason that they're up there is because the word that Paul uses for transformed here is the Greek word metamorphosis. And what it means is a complete change in form, like going from being a caterpillar to a butterfly. That's the idea that God wants us to have in mind here, that through his word of grace, he changes our hearts and lives completely so that as we go about our lives now, we see things the way that God sees them. He tunes our hearts into his heart. He tunes our vision to see things the way he wants us to see them so we can look at the world around us and make judgments about what is in line with God's will and what is not in line with God's will. See, rather than us being conformed to the pattern of the world around us, God goes to work in our hearts to conform us to his ideas and to his attitude about things. He wants us to be right in line with everything he is and thinks. Again, it's total commitment that God is looking for on our part. One result of this is that it allows us to make an honest evaluation of ourselves as God's people. An honest evaluation that is both humbling and also encouraging. Paul says, do not think of yourself more highly than you ought, but rather think of yourself with sober judgment in accordance with the faith that God has distributed to each of you. So Paul is essentially saying, View yourself, look at yourself the way that God looks at you. And the starting point for that is knowing that apart from him, we're nothing. Apart from him, we can do nothing. That would be the evaluation of ourselves. But the truth is, we're not apart from him. And that changes everything. Because of the work that God has done in our hearts, because he has brought us into his family and made us a part of his body, that changes things. That transforms us completely. It means that we are uniquely gifted now as God's people so that we are able to serve him and to serve others. We are uniquely gifted now so that we are able to offer ourselves as the living sacrifices that God has called us to be. And there are all sorts of different ways for us to do that as God's people. Paul mentions a few examples. He talks about preaching and teaching. He talks about serving and leading. He talks about encouraging, showing mercy, 
giving generously, things like that. But it's not an exhaustive list that he gives. Instead, his simple point is really this. Each one of us has different gifts according to the grace given to each of us. And these gifts are to be used not simply to serve ourselves, but rather to serve God and to serve others. These gifts are to be offered in their entirety as we put ourselves out there as living sacrifices in this world. That's the commitment that God calls for from us, his people. That's the Christian life. And it's all-consuming. And all that sounds pretty good, doesn't it? I mean, all of God's people, gifted by him, offering themselves as living sacrifices, putting themselves out there to serve God and others in all that they do, doesn't that sound good? There's a problem, though, right? The problem is that we don't always want to do that. Maybe we often don't want to do that. See, we have that sinful nature that isn't interested in conforming itself to God's ways because it's much more comfortable conforming to the ways of the world. We have this sinful nature that isn't interested in serving God and others, but only wants to serve ourselves. It talks to us when we think about this idea of offering ourselves as living sacrifices and, and serving others. It reminds us, you know, remember those times that you put yourself out there to serve? That was great, wasn't it? Nobody thanked you for it. There was no gratitude. Maybe they even criticized what you did. Why would you want to do that again? Or our sinful nature is there to say, you know, look around you. You see many other people putting themselves out there to serve God and others and all that they do. Why are you going to make that commitment? Offer yourself as a living sacrifice? Why? There's another problem, too. Even if we would want to do that, is it even possible for us to do? I mean, to offer the sort of service that Paul describes in these verses, are we really up to that? If we've tried in the past, we know that we often fail when we strive to serve God. We often fail badly. We know that we're not going to have that total commitment that God desires of his people. We don't have it in us. So yeah, we might say to ourselves it would be great if everybody were out doing this. But why are God's people going to want to do this? And how is it even going to be possible for God's people to do this? Offer yourselves as living sacrifices, total commitment. Well, there's five little words right at the beginning of our verses today that give us the answer. Five little words that tell us both the why and the how. Paul said, in view of God's mercy. Why would we offer ourselves as living sacrifices? Because God so loved the world, you and me included, that he gave his one and only son. Because Jesus offered himself as the atoning sacrifice for our sins. Because Jesus offered himself as a living sacrifice to spare us from the judgment that our sins deserve. So why? In view of God's mercy, right? Right? Not so that we can get something for ourselves, although we'll often find that as we serve God and others, it is very rewarding and brings joy to our hearts. We don't do it so that others will thank us, although we'll find that as we're serving God, God's people will regularly express their gratitude. And God himself promises that he will acknowledge even the smallest things that his people do in his name. No, the reason why we offer ourselves as living sacrifices is simply this, in view of God's mercy to us. Or as Paul says in another place, because Christ's love compels us. 
So we know the why. But what about the how? See, the same answer applies. See, God's mercy encompasses much more than just a rescue from the punishment that our sins deserve. It also includes that new creation that God has made us in Jesus, that total transformation that we spoke about early, earlier. How are we supposed to offer ourselves as living sacrifices? Because we are now God's workmanship, created in Christ Jesus to do Good works, ones that God has prepared in advance for us to do even. Because we are God's workmanship, forged in the waters of baptism, strengthened through his word of grace to offer ourselves daily as the living sacrifices that he has called us to be. That's the commitment we make as God's people. You know, I mentioned earlier that I anticipate all 10 of those confirmands are going to answer yes to those questions regarding their commitment to the Lord and to the Christian life. But there's a little more to it than that. They're going to say more than just yes as they answer those questions. They're going to say yes, and I ask God to help me. And in doing so, they're acknowledging that truth that we have a God who works in us both the desire and the ability to offer ourselves as living sacrifices. The God who provides for us both the why and the how when it comes to serving him. But even so, as God's people, aren't we still going to mess it up sometimes? Maybe a lot of times. Yeah, I mean, we still have that sinful nature. We still have that sinful nature that wants nothing to do with offering itself as a living sacrifice to anyone. That's true. That struggle is going to continue within us. We're not going to be perfect. And even the good things that we strive to do in God's kingdom are going to be tainted by motives that often aren't very good. You know, the Apostle Paul understood that too. He knew about that struggle within. You know, just a few verses before this, he had this to say. The good I want to do, I do not. But the evil I don't want to do, that I keep on doing. What a wretched man I am. That's what we're going to see in our lives as we strive every day to offer ourselves in service to God and others to live committed as his people, that wretchedness is still going to be evident day after day. So Paul says, thanks be to God who gives us the victory through our Lord Jesus Christ. See, this is what he wants us to remember. That mercy of our God that forgiveness of our God, that doesn't quit on the day he calls us to be his people and we start serving him. No, that goes with us day after day. The same forgiving love that brought us from unbelief to faith, the same forgiving love that brought us from death to life, that forgiving love that washed us clean from each and every one of our sins. God continues to shower us with that same love each and every day to cover completely that wretchedness that still clings to us as we live in this world. The point is to live and do all that we do as God's people always in view of his mercy. The only way that Jesus' words in the gospel make sense, the only way that Paul's encouragement here in Romans chapter 12 makes sense is in view of God's mercy. So what should we do then as God's people? Should we really focus our efforts and energy on serving God and others better and really fully committing ourselves to the total cause of our Savior's kingdom? No, what we should do first is simply this. Focus on the one who offered himself for you. Let his voice 
be the one that captures your full attention each and every day. Let his house and his altar be that place that you can't bear to be away from. Let every moment of every day be lived fully in view of God's mercy in Jesus. Because that's going to give you the focus and the vision that you need to approach everything else that God sets before you in this life. In view of the one who offered himself for you and who continues to serve you with his grace day after day, offer yourself as a living sacrifice to him and to his people. This is your true and proper worship. Amen. And may the peace of God, which surpasses all understanding, guard and keep your hearts and minds through faith in Christ Jesus. Amen. Amen.